Life isn't fair, I thought. I remembered saying that once to a bartender over in Silver City. He would looked wise as an owl and replied, Nor will it ever be. I hate it when bartenders are right. In the week that followed, the rest of the Roundup crew showed up. The nightly poker games continued as before, and the bunkhouse was filled with laughter, cuss words, and smoke. When the lamp finally went out and the boys were all bedded down, I'd lay there in my blankets and listen to the snoring and night sounds. I had cut back on my coffee drinking, but I still lay wakeful. This was not, as some might suppose, because I had a guilty conscience, but because my thoughts were of those who did, or leastways should have. Three times that week I heard Billy get up and slip out into the darkness. I don't know how long he was away from the bunkhouse at those times. I drifted off to sleep before he came back. I was worried about my friends. It seemed to me they were riding a chancy trail with no way for the journey to end well. But I couldn't tell them that. If I had, they would likely have told me to mind my own business. And rightly so. I took to helping Dobelly put the final touches on his preparations. Together we mended harness, greased the hubs on the wagon wheels, and filled the chuck box with groceries and supplies. I put new shoes on the teams, fetched and carried, and generally tried to make myself useful. The M Cross wagon carried a two day supply of water in a barrel attached to its side. Dobelly asked me to fill the barrel with fresh water, and I said I would. I hitched the team to the wagon and drove it over to the good spring below the main house. It was a pretty morning. A grove of aspens, their new leaves a shimmer in the breeze, shaded the east side of the house. It was a warm day for May, and I noticed a couple of the windows facing the spring were open. From somewhere nearby I heard the call of a killdeer. Out on the flat a meadowlark sang. I bent to the spring and began to fill the keg. That's when I heard what I never meant to hear. The sound of voices came from inside the house, one the deep, angry voice of Thane McAllister, the other that of his daughter Julie. They were arguing, Thane laying down the law, and Julie defying him. At first I couldn't make out the words, only the anger and the bitterness. Then the words came, and before I could leave or declare my presence, I had heard too much. The day I had feared and expected had come. No, you will not marry that half-breed Bronx Stomper, Thane was saying. Not while I live. I have tolerated your wild misbehavior these past years, but I will not let you throw your life away. I love him, Daddy, Julie replied, and nothing you say or do can change that. I'm going to marry Billy, whether you approve or not. Approve? How could I approve of my only daughter taking up with a cheap drifter like that, let alone talk of marrying him? 